If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, yeah, yeah. For the first 44 minutes, we do our introductory conversation. I mention... Justin looking sexy. Justin's amazing... I mean, did you doubt it? Viore. Always. These ones Shorts. don't have holes in the crotch. Now, <laughs> now Viore... You pay <laughs> extra for holy crotches or... <laughs> I have to get them reinforced. He's, so, he's yeah. got a, he's got Viore's the, cool about He's got that. the wire mesh. He's got big balls. <laughs> he's got big he's balls. The biggest balls of them all. Oh, oh. Nobody knows what that is because oh, yeah. we're too old. Uh, Viore is a... High High quality um, athletic gear, especially for men. Yes. Great looking stuff. Especially with men with big balls. We'll give yeah. you twenty five percent off. We need room, and they provide. If it. you use our code, go to Viori Clothing. That's V U O R I Clothing dot com forward slash Mind Pump. You'll get twenty five percent off. That's Anything. a hookup. Twenty five percent. Yep. Then we talk Primo. about new media and the evolution of the mind. I think we're in the middle of a revolution it's that's starting exciting to exciting stuff very exciting we're talking about the savvy consumer consumers are much smarter today than they were 10 years ago and the rise of companies like thrive market hence why they use thrive we market. think thrive market is a great example of this now thrive market's the largest online retailer of non-gmo foods and organic foods and other products that are within that umbrella if you go to thrivemarket.com forward slash mind pump, we will hook you up. Here's with an idea. Okay. A month free membership. I'm going to give you guys an idea. What's the idea? You got to, to this episode specifically, every time we say thrive, take a shot. Because it's it. going to be a lot. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good shot. Everybody's going to be hammered. I think I do six in a row. There yeah. was like a ton in this episode. <laughs> yeah. I love it. So you get a free membership, a free month membership. We're hooking you up. $20 off your first three orders of $49 or more and free shipping. We talk about low quality dog food and fat and sick dogs. Although fat dogs are kind of cute. That's sad though. Yeah, they are kind of cute yeah. and chubby. We talk about motivations for pursuing health and fitness and the beginning of a health revolution we hope to be a part of. Mm. Then we get into the questions. The first question was, this person uh, has very developed trap muscles. They seem to be tight. Her job is as a dental hygienist. What movements and exercises and stretches can she do to prevent these tight trap muscles from happening? The next question was, they want us to discuss the differences in body composition or body fat between men and women. What's the difference? What's considered healthy? What's considered unhealthy? What mm. do they look like? All that stuff. The next question was directed to Adam. The question was, during your road to pro, what were some of the major setbacks that you faced and how did you overcome them? Of course, Adam has no setbacks and no roadblocks. <laughs> uh, but I did course. get on a rant for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the, the next question was, this He's individual determined SOB. is a golfer and is feeling stiff and not fluid in their movements. How do we suggest they prime before they play to maximize their performance? Also, this month, we are putting our foundational MAPS Anabolic Program, the program we think most people should start in, great for muscle building, great for metabolism repair. If you've got a slow metabolism, this is the program you want to get on to get that metabolism to roar again. We're putting that program on 50% off sale, half. So the price is cut completely in half. It's happening the entire month of July. Now, we also have bundles of MAPS programs. This is where we combine MAPS programs for particular goals and discount them by 20 to 30% off. For example, our super bundle is a year of exercise programming all planned out for you. You can find MAPS Anabolic 50% off and all these bundles at mindpumpmedia.com. Justin, two. you know what I like about what you're wearing right now? What's that? Everything. First off, fits you perfectly. That's, so it's not too yes. tight, not too big. It's I don't feel restricted. There's no holes in and, his crotch. And <laughs> there's no holes in his crotch. He was working up to that. And like, the uh, quality of the Vior those are Viori, I'm assuming. They are Viori. Okay. Yeah. They're not going like to rip. Khaki. Yeah. They're color, not going to awesome. rip like the other ones because you squat no, these. I, no, they stretch. They give me. They, are those they have the, give to them? Are those the board short ones? These no. are not the board short. Oh, we These just the so we just ordered the board. Yeah, we did board short ones. Uh -huh. What color did you get? So I got the, it, was, it was like three tiered color. So it was like kind of a blue and gray, like um, different. Uh, what did you layered get? colors? I got uh, purple, and I did. got. Of course you did. Yeah. Match your grapes, your and fucking bikini grapes underwear. <laughs> my, you know what's funny about that? You don't even need to wear underwear with these I, shorts, man. 
Another can't. Awesome. First of all, have you guys seen me walk around my underwears yet? Have I done that? Yeah, you have. Uh, okay. All the time. Do I do it every time? Yeah, dude. I guess I do, don't we I? We sauntered together. Oh, yeah. That was a good time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other the the other thing I was going to tell you guys, well, besides those awesome shorts, I ordered a new bathing suit the other day. Yeah. And I can't wait to show you guys. Really? When we go to uh, <laughs> we go to like a when real, we go to refuge, a real scandalous one. No, my girl keeps telling me to get shorts that are like short, short shorts, chubbies. Oh man! Yeah, they're called Why? chubbies, aren't they? Well, Why? there's brand, there's a brand called chubbies that's really popular. Yeah, so now I, like I got the, those. I like Viore has a shorter cut too, like the ones Justin's wearing. I like the, I like yeah, the style. Mine, mine hike up a bit. I mean, you guys are blessed with my white thighs. Yeah, they're nice. Yeah, they're <laughs> they're impressive. It's like a beacon. To space, it is. A, it's, a, it's a beacon. It's a homing signal. What do you your know? thighs? <laughs> I kind of like tractor beam them in. Adam, I got a joke for you. Tell me. What do Justin's thighs and the Great Wall of China have in common? Mm. You can see them from space. <laughs> Was that a joke? <laughs> oh, all right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll edit that one out. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Dad jokes have started. That's almost as good as this. We're not even out of here, and the dad Woo! jokes have started already. Oh, uh, dude, how um, how awesome was that first 15 minutes of conversation on Peterson and uh, Rogan? Yeah. I love anything that Peterson know, puts it's, out there. It's hard dude, not to oh. just but get I feel like we almost we almost jock him too much. You know what I'm saying? Like we 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 talk about him a lot, but he's everything he puts out is fire, dude. Well, yeah. the thing I, I have yet to listen to a conversation that he's had that hasn't I mean, well, there's always something where you're like, like oh, thought shit. provoking. Yeah, very good. Exactly. You know? And yeah. I don't agree with him 100% no, of the time, it, by the way. But it's the way that, I mean, it's the information he's presenting. It's just like, oh, finally, people are talking about shit that matters. Well, dude, he's traveling around the country and he's doing these debates, yeah. live debates yeah. in front of 5,000 people with Sam Harris. Right. So they're literally on the same stage. Sam Harris, an atheist and a very smart one. So very, very smart. Very difficult. Oh. You're not going to win. You're not going to beat him in a debate unless you yourself are extremely intelligent and can present yourself well. Right. And then you have Peterson, who is on the like the pro spiritual or religious type side, right? Yeah. And they sit there and they discuss and debate in front of. Five thousand people. There's no yelling. There's no. Well, screaming. And admittedly, no- like they've done two podcasts before, and those didn't go very well. Especially the first one didn't go very well. They got hung up on a couple things, yeah. like you know certain, and and it just it just shows like uh, them being able to then keep working at it, and then like having a conversation to keep trying to figure out. That's the important. Part. Well, the thing that he the point that he made that blew me. I watched it last night, and I paused it, and I had to think about it for five to ten minutes i had to really absorb what he was saying because i we've talked about on the show many times how technology is okay so if we go back in time and we look at rapid advancements in human civilization they tend to follow a some kind of an advancement in the in our ability to share and spread information so like when humans discovered that they could you know uh, write and record information that was a huge advancement because we can now build upon the knowledge of people before Mm -hmm. and before that we had to sing songs and stuff to remember certain things so now all of a sudden boom explosion right the next and there's many of these right but the next big one or the one of the biggest ones was the the gutenberg revolution this is when the the printing press which was invented by you know guy's last name was obviously gutenberg he invented the printing press and all of a sudden charles yeah (laughs) i think it's charles (laughs) yeah all of a sudden the average person had access to books and what people don't realize, especially a lot of uh, people our age or younger, is that at that time, the only people who had access to books were- Like royalty and stuff. Royalty and, and noble, you know, nobles the and the church. Yeah, the monks. And why? Because books had to be written by hand, and you had to know how to write and read. And so if you wanted to own a book, you had to be rich. They were expensive as hell. So the only way you could get information was by going to the church or going to the nobles, and they would have to- distill it for you and of course people are going to interpret it exactly and 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 so now you've got a printing press now the average person can afford a book because they're cheap and it was this explosion of evolution and many people believe it it's really what led to the renaissance Renaissance, uh right yeah so you have that but what we have with technology is the gutenberg revolution times a trillion because Mm -hmm. now we have tech that allows essentially infinite amounts of information to be spread mm-hmm. anywhere and for cheap, for very, very, very cheap. And the point that Peterson made that I thought was brilliant because he brought that up, but the part that I thought that was brilliant was he said that 
the power of written word is now being displayed by spoken word. Yeah. And what I mean by that is like, you can always put way more detail and thought into writing. Like, and it really has to do with bandwidth, right? Like, this is why it's so hard to turn a book into a movie. I mean, how many people get into a book, really read a good book, and then watch the movie and they're like, ah, you know, it's not as good as the book. Yeah. You can't possibly make a movie like the book because with the movie, you're limited to like two hours yeah. on average, right? And a book is, you know, 300, 400 pages and it's really in depth and really detailed. And this is true with, uh, you know, discussions on, um, you know, complicated topics as well. And, what, you know, TV and radio did it a little bit. And what Peterson was saying was, you were limited, you know, with TV, like there were only so many channels and people would watch it for 30 minutes to maybe an hour. Conversations would last six to 10 minutes. So it was like condensed into entertainment, like short bits of, you know, you know, bites of information. Right. Interrupted and, by commercials. Yeah. And it was, you know, so you couldn't really hear the whole discussion or get the whole thing. But because of tech, you know, we can put out a podcast that's four hours long, which we've done before talking about one subject yeah. and having a really good discussion. And what's happening is that's spreading mm -hmm. and the the spoken word spreads faster because written word takes more time and requires you to really pay attention where you can listen and you know more people can understand word than can read word even. And it gets spread everywhere. And what's happening now is you're seeing this long form discussion explode. And the, the, the thing that the statement that he made that I thought was 100% true, which was brilliant, is people are a lot smarter than we thought they were. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it, that that resonated too when I was listening to that. Just because I think that we we've all been fed this formula and this this format, and that's like the standard that was provided just by the old way of doing things with media. Mm -hmm. And so it's all this like quick snippets and um, you know argumentative type of uh, content that's out there that nobody ever gets to really put their entire point across or they, they take it out of context and people are just fed up with that shit. It's mm -hmm. just like, it's not benefiting anybody in society. It's doing nothing but polarizing everybody, making everybody emotional and you see what that's done. It's fucking chaotic, you know, and, and people consumers are, are tired are a lot of it. smarter now. Like, yeah. Well, I think the consumers was always smart, but we, they were limited by technology and time. And so if you I, I don't think that's necessarily true because Jordan Peterson and these types of guys could have still done the types of like he talks about how you know they're getting up on these in these 5000 8000 10000 you know audiences and you know the the format is let's talk for 1 hour and then open Q&A right. and people are still thirsty for mm -hmm. two and a half three hours. now that didn't really that wasn't happening like it's happening now and we see examples of this in, in, in all different spaces of media including long form podcast you see it i mean but i don't think it's the consumer that's changed i think it's the fact that now they're being like here's the thing oh see would, i think it is I well think, no i'll I, tell you well they're changing also because of it but here's the thing would peterson be able to fill 8,000, 10,000 seat auditoriums without internet, without, because he was doing this before he was talking to, to classrooms and stuff. And there were definitely people doing this and there were definitely books on philosophy, books on this type of stuff, but it wasn't reaching tons of people. So now you've got people who've never I think, heard I of, think we've evolved as humans and we're much smarter. We're smarter today than when we were 50 years ago and 100 years ago and 200 years that's ago. That's also true. So I think there's mm -hmm. there's a thirst for that type of content that there wasn't yeah. there before. Yeah. People didn't want to sit through and listen to something for that long. It was too long. It was, and so that's part of the argument too is that it's not just technology that's disrupting us. It's just us as humans, we're evolving now to where we can consume that type mm. of content. We want that. And we and look to Justin's point, we're getting fed up of the the cookie cutter bullshit market advertised to me commercials type of deal. Like, give me the real yeah, meat and potatoes of why I'm here. We don't need to just escape anymore. You know, and I think that maybe that was relevant after like wars and you know, and like the hardships and like it like escaping was was such a big part of entertainment. Like I want I want to just be able to relax and be numb. And um, people are really hungry to 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 and better like better their life and learn and 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 they're they're curious you know as as to like listening to really intelligent people explain things like that so i'm well, i'm reading that iGen book right now and they talk a lot about this that it's you know and the, the generation coming up is even more yeah so here's the crazy part right like i and i told you guys before like you're starting to see these kids in high school are aren't going out to parties and they're not socializing with friends anymore 
but they are they're consuming content and information like this this long for and they're they're educating themselves they're they're not becoming dumber and they're educating they're gener- themselves right, right rather than you know someone else telling right, them right right yeah. so the, the, what there's a lot of this stir everyone's you know like always and you've talked about this point before Sal is that you know the the old guard is always like oh my god this generation coming yeah, up it's the same a, thing right yeah. everybody always says that that's been saying that forever right always. so there's this big fear around oh these these you know millennials and iGeners are just going to be so socially unaware and they're going to be this or that but the flip could be they may be the smartest generation that we've ever seen because they started consuming content like this at a very right. very young age where I'm just now at, at I'm 36 years old and I'm just now really starting to consume content at this fast yeah. of a rate and and me it's like okay well it's because it, we didn't have the tech like you're saying like i really you know i couldn't you couldn't keep my attention to read a book after book a book but i dude i could sit well, through it's different like when you sat through in school like there there wasn't any of that engagement it was just being thrown at you and you're memorizing mm-hmm. so it's like now things are just starting to click because um, people are understanding how, how much more they have to communicate to be able to get the point across. And now we have access to people that are passionate about topics that you can sit and listen to their brilliant mind that and you get sucked into that versus like being stuck at school and tr- forcing yourself to fucking try and memorize. Well, well look, at, look at how hard it was before. Look at all the barriers that existed before versus today so we'll use fitness because that's our that's our field primarily right let's look at fitness 30 years ago if you had really good uh, information if you had if you really wanted to communicate some things about fitness and exercise and nutrition there was a few barriers you had to overcome one was okay how do i get in a magazine or how do i get on tv and in order to do that i have to placate the big corporate sponsors that run the magazines Mm -hmm. and big TV. Uh So if I want to come out and I want to say, hey, listen, uh, you don't need to eat like every two hours. That's kind of bullshit. You know what the magazine's going to say? They're going to look at this and they're going to bring it to their sponsors and the sponsors will say, no, we don't want that information. So the next step would be, okay, and this is before internet. What would I do? Well, I could write a book, but how am I going to get people to know about my book? How am I going to get It's so many barriers to enter the market and to get your information out. Whereas today, like our podcast never would would have never existed. Nobody would have given us the time of day to be able to get our word out. Nobody would have heard what we have to say. And that's what's, I think that's what's really happening. Is that- Well, the irony though, podcasting has been out for nine, 10 years now. But what I think that's is a really, blip. This is a blip. In it time. is, but still it's been around for a long time and blogging before that, you know what I'm saying? So the, it's, I really think it's the generation coming up now. Where there's a mm. thirst for knowledge and information now that we're a much the the iGeners are a much more growth minded set of a group of people, and so were the millennials, and so were the baby. I mean, it, we're just keep evolving as humans. So I think it's 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 less of the technology than you think it is, well, and it's here- more of the of of the people now because of technology, you have access to all these things at a faster rate, and people are that's are, what drives it are, I'll, are I'll, driving it. I'll, but you you even have these kids like so they they did this study it was crazy with these teenagers that were that weren't really dating like that you know there's a big thing going on right now with this the high school high school generation right they're not you know going out with boyfriends and girlfriends and dating very much you know the the most common answer given back for why they're not is because they know that their brains are young and still developing and that there's something that happens on a on a chemical level in the brain when they when they fall in love with someone at that young of an age and it actually affects their decision making and their personal growth. So part of their Yeah, where'd they get that information? Like, are you kidding me? Like yeah. I didn't think like that when I was yeah. sixteen well, years old. Like who thinks so, like that? So here's why here's why it's it's here's why it's the the tech and the culture. And here's not why it's not some evolution of the mind or 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 sorry, it is an evolution of the mind. It is not some evolutionary genetic thing. Okay. Today, two thousand eighteen there are still tribes in the world that don't understand how to create tech. There's still people in the world that don't know how to read. There's still people in the world that don't know basic things to progress themselves. And that's because it's not presented to them and they don't have access to this information. That's it. Bottom line. The reason, look, let me give you another example. The last 20 years, we saw a reduction in the world's lowest rung of poverty or extreme poverty by something like 50%. That was the fastest reduction in, in extreme poverty that the world had ever, ever, ever seen. 
And that's directly the result of a few things, the, the freeing up of markets and then the technology that followed that allowed people to, like right now, the fastest reduction in extreme poverty is in Africa. In Africa, you see people lifting themselves very rapidly because people are having cell phones and have access to this kind of information. This is what's driving the evolution uh, of the mind. It's always been what's driven the evolution of the mind. It's the, same, it's the reason why, you know, 2,000 years ago, you had cultures with running water and plumbing, and you had other cultures that were still cannibals because some of them had access to information and, and others kind of didn't. So that's kind of what's driving it. And what's exciting to me is – you know, we're so afraid of what tech and information is doing because we always tend to be alarmist. But the reality is, it's pretty fucking awesome. Well, they're evolving so quickly. And I think what's happening, and we've seen this in the three years we've been in the market in uh, podcasting. In the last three years, I have already seen changes in just the fitness industry. And that's our own bubble. But I've already started to see it happen. And it's happening so much faster than it happened before. And I've been like, again, we've all been in, in this market. This is happening to everything. People are discussing these complex issues, which you could never, you could never have a good discussion and understanding of a complex issue with a 10 minute conversation on TV or sound bites. It just won't happen. All you're going to get is zingers and mudslinging and, ooh, that was a good comeback. But you could never have someone sit down and really talk about the complex issues. But today, look, uh, he even brought this up on the, on, it, on the Rogan podcast as well. Netflix proved that, so TV in the past, the longest a TV show would last ever would be like an hour, hour and a half. That was the, the longest they could possibly do because the time, the attention span wasn't long enough uh, or, or at least the bandwidth wasn't big enough. You had advertisers. It just didn't work. Now you have Netflix putting together series that are 40 hours long and now they can illustrate all the complexities of a story like a book could. And guess what? People are more people are watching that shit. You know, than it's the funny stuff on you TV. say that, and you're 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 touting this right now. And Game of Thrones is the greatest example of that. Yeah. Oh, I I, I, would, I don't, <laughs> you don't disagree. Say that. that is the greatest example of what you're talking <laughs> oh, about. Oh, I don't right disagree. Now. That 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 show is probably one of the most detailed. That was a home run of right. a show. Oh, well, I, I don't disagree. Absolutely. And that's why it was why it's so revolutionary right now is is partially to the point that you're making right totally. now. Totally, sure. Is that it's yeah. it's changed it's changed how we can even watch a series. It's a novel on you know finally in like a, a movie form, but like it's long form, so you can actually you can get vested into all these characters, mm -hmm. and it can be complex. Like, it, but but that's the thing. It, it looks a lot more, even though it's fantasy. You know, it it resembles a lot more of like real realistic type things. Things that you're going to come across in, in life well, and, and they, they're able to depict it yeah, right. through literature. Well, that, well, that's how like good novels were back in the day. Well, that's the point. I think we're realizing people are smarter and more complex than our tech allowed us to be before. Like 20, 30 years ago, if I brought Game of Thrones to a major advertiser or producer yeah, or network, work. they'd be like, fuck no. It's like, what is it, 50 hours long? It's how many seasons? Yeah, yeah. No, we're not going to invest in, in this at all. This is way too... Condense this in 45 minutes or an hour, and now we'll talk. Could you tell the Game of Thrones story in an hour and a half? No fucking Absolutely way. impossible. It would change the whole thing. Yeah. And so that's the exciting part for me is even in our space of fitness, we are able to discuss these complex issues. We could talk about We could debate them. Mm. We could have good discussion that doesn't have to turn into yelling and pointing fingers. And when you allow that, you know what's more likely to happen is the truth mm -hmm. is more likely to come out. It's hard to, to get the truth out when you have 10 minutes because sometimes the person that comes across as the right person is the more charismatic one of the person who has the zingers yeah. or maybe 10 minutes is enough time for them to make their basic point. And it's not even nearly long well, enough it, for you to make it your point. For, it forces authenticity. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it forces it because that's a great point. Yeah, mm -hmm. it forces authenticity because you can't. It's very try to be fake in two, <laughs> two, you know, two hours. You can't yeah. carry the momentum yeah. of that. Right, right. Two There's hours. No way. You know, allow me to say something really smart and then cut me. Yeah. And then then let me prepare again and then say something smart again and then cut me again. Like yeah, I could do that all day long and then we can comp compile it together to make a two two hour long podcast. But nobody does that anymore, right? The way that, right. the way we do podcasting now is this long form, which, I mean, you're you don't have the you don't have the ability well, to do dude, that. And this is why if you're in if you're in business, you have to pay attention to this because the consumer's evolving so rapidly that the old stuff before may not work. Now, there are definitely some things that will work, but there may be some stuff that's not going to work. I'll give you a great example. When we're marketing fitness products, you used to have to assume people were dumb 
You mm-hmm. did. Mm-hmm. You'd be like, here, boom, burn fat. Here, you know, 30 days. Here. Today, you can actually be a little smarter. You could say something like, you know, uh, three phases for maximum muscle hypertrophy. Nobody knew what the fuck that meant 15 years ago. Today, if I do that, I'm probably going to get my interest. People are going to be like, oh, I know what hypertrophy is. Yeah. And I'm not, even, I'm not even exaggerating. Or if they don't, they're curious as to what that means. M- much more so. People are just much more, they're much more educated or much more informed because it's allowing us to be this way. So if, if you look at the market this way, I think you're probably smart and better off. And I, I guarantee you what I'm saying now is not going to be controversial 10 years from now. I guarantee you 10 years from now, everybody's going to be saying this. You now you assume your, your your audience is smart rather than assume that they're dumb, which is what they used to tell you to do. Assume your audience is dumb. Don't get too technical, which is still kind of true, but you can get way more technical today than you could before, and people will actually yeah. appreciate it a little bit more than they did before. Well, it's our job to simplify the information. Yes, you know, always like yep. we have to think in those terms, not but not like think of our audiences like these idiots that that we're just trying to corral. It's it's more of just. It's our job to present it in a way where it's understandable right away, and then we can get we can get even further in depth as we kind of go. Well, along. look at food. Look how pe- people are picking food now. Part of it is people are wealthier, and, and part of it's accessibility. The part of it is people are more educated. Would a company like your would a company like Thrive Market would that even work? A company that sells all non GMO back then it was mostly organic, and they place a high value on quality, and then of course you know helping people who can't afford. To mm-hmm. eat this particular way, would that have ever humanitarian worked? pursuits? Yeah, would that have ever worked? Yeah, I don't think now so. today you have, and of course, part of it is again, tech is allowing them to eliminate middlemen, deliver directly to your door. Well, you know, that's the, that's the big key right that's, there. That's a huge one. I, I'm sure people would have loved to have a similar business model 20, 30 years ago, but you just didn't have the ability to cut all these middle people out. Well, you know, it's funny. Yeah. There was there were things that existed like this, uh, like uh, what was that meat company? I, it's been around forever. You could buy frozen meat. And they Swanson? Would, no, well, Swanson delivered food, and then there was oh, yeah. another one that was like Omaha. Oh yeah, Omaha, Omaha. steaks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and right. they would do that, and and they didn't really like, you know what I mean? It wasn't like this huge, like making a big. Well, dent. you're it, we were also paying a very high price for that stuff. Omaha steaks are expensive. Now yeah, it's good yeah. quality that you're getting. That's where that's where Thrive just killed the game. Thrive to me reminds me more of like what Costco did to the the grocery market. Yeah. Like they came in, they came in and just fucked. Costco just fucked the whole grocery market up for everybody. You know what I'm saying? They came in and they just made it so inexpensive that it's a no brainer. It's like if you are somebody who shops for more than two people, Costco is like a must have. It's like well, everybody has a Costco card just in case. Well, people who buy, uh, who people, in, it used to be people who wanted to buy organic, non GMO, you know, fair trade, all these different things, right? People that used to be such a small niche. Highly educated, very wealthy market. That's what it was, right? Whole Foods now has exploded to the point where Amazon bought them. They're a major, you know, uh, pro- uh, grocer. Thrive Market exploding because they provide these things, but also because the general consumer is now moving into that space that used to be this small, exclusive, wealthy, educated space. Now the average person knows exactly. Right. And people laugh when I say this, but you know, and I'm not even that old. Okay, yeah, I'm definitely old, but I'm not that old. There was a point when nobody knew what the fuck organic meant. Wasn't that long ago? Wasn't that long ago that if I went to if I wanted organic food, I had to find a special organic store. I'm talking like 20 years ago. Do you remember where you used to go 20 years ago to yeah, buy? Yeah, no. It was very difficult to find. Now you can go to Safeway. Oh, yeah. And then I always used to hear people like they get all like technical about the the term organic and like everything's organic. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, <laughs> it's like it's all gr- like made out of something from you know the earth. And I'm just like get fuck out of here with yeah. the technicalities. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know what's cool with Thrive too? I actually this last time when I just ordered the dog food, which I haven't got it yet. Oh, you did. I'll, I'll share with you guys when I actually get it. Would you get the big bag or? Yeah, yeah, I got. I ordered the, a brand that I don't order already, so we'll see how. The, I'll tell you how the dogs like it and yada yada, but and how long it takes to get there. But I just literally ordered it yesterday. Yeah, that's a good call, man. I gotta get on that. Right. They also you have the, the the app. So if you guys haven't downloaded the app, the app is cool, and the app is they're always constantly adding new things. Like just like even like the dog food, I didn't even know that until Doug pulled that up. Like it's only a matter of time before these guys fucking offer everything and anything that you would probably potentially buy from a grocery store. How is the price of the dog food? It's always competitive, dude. It's always better. It's always better. Yeah, it's it's crazy That's how they're it, able you know, to do that. Crazy. It's just like Costco. How it's do like, you compare high, like high quality for you know cheaper? Dude, if I'm if I'm a if I'm a, a brick and mortar business, I'm shitting my oh, pants. Oh, for right sure, now. I don't want to be in that space. right I now. I am no. shitting my pants. 
I mean, Whole Foods, you know, merging with Amazon. I mean, that's gonna that'll hopefully save them, right? Because of you know, because of Amazon. But that is a scary situation to be in to be a brick and mortar and see what's happening. Like, how do you compete with there it is, with Kevin. some of the stuff? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. Man. I read this thing about dog food actually the other day, and you know how little most of the popular dog foods, how most of them are pure vegan. Like most of them are all grains. All they'll throw pea protein in there for protein. And then they'll color the dog food to make it look like it's got meat in it. Brown, yeah. And then if you read carefully, it was this whole video on it. I forgot to send it to you. I I was going to send it to you, Adam, because I knew you'd love it. At at the bottom of these dog foods, it'll say chicken, pork, and lamb flavor, real small at the bottom. (laughs) But there's no chicken, pork, or lamb. It's all artificially flavored. Super processed. Dusted on it. And then they were showing the ingredients, and I was like, wow, that is a... That is a science experiment. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's like almost no real food in there. Oh, do you, I, I mean, know. it's, I, you're going to see this, and I've, I've been saying this for a while, that you're going to see the same thing that we're seeing with humans, you're going to see with, with animals. People treat their their animals like humans, and the same type of marketing bullshit that we've been seeing for humans forever, like the no trans fat, or low sugar, or non-fat. Same like, thing. Right. Same, you see the Added same- Added protein. Yeah, yeah do, they do the same thing with dogs. Like, keto you, dog food. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> keto <laughs> dog food, I'm sure it exists. Dude, Post, post-walk. Just oh, watch, man. bro. It's going to get- My dog's paleo. What's I, your I mean, dog right now? Uh, yeah. I, I don't know anybody else, that, or at least I don't personally know anybody else. All my friends still feed- Thousand feed vegan. their dogs the same way but everybody thinks I'm weird or cruel to my dogs because I feed them accordingly to their exercise like I literally how pay- funny is that yeah. that people think you're yeah. being mean yeah people think I'm being cruel that's like that, what yeah. do you mean you're, you're not gonna feed him you're gonna skip like, he's gonna need to skip a meal he didn't walk for two days ago he already put on like three Bro, pounds I saw yeah. I saw a guy yesterday management. walking right. down the street he was obviously obese so big dude he was walking his dog I don't know what 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 uh, breed. breed it was it was a small dog but the dog was so fucking fat that it almost couldn't walk with its feet and i see this big fat dude with his big fat dog and i'm just like and what's funny about that is when i see that it makes me think of when you have parents who are really overweight with really overweight kids and like oh it's our genetics what's your excuse with your dog dude it's not your dog you say that you say that and this is something that actually fucking Uh, stung for me big time you guys know that just what a couple weeks ago it's only been about three or four weeks when i had the big scare with mozzie right and we almost lost him and, you know, the takeaway for me was not the, oh, did he potentially get into something or got some random flu? It was that because my dog was also overweight, like he potentially could have died. Like mm. the increase, his chances increased of dying because of that. It was a, a breathing issue on him. And the fact that he was 15 pounds overweight, well, that's like me being like 40 pounds overweight. And ironically, it happened during this time that I'm down and out and I wasn't training myself. And so my my movement was also affecting him and that's what happens to these people same thing happens. Oh, because you weren't able to move because you're right like that's part of my routine is i walk my dogs every single day well i wasn't really doing that very often i mean i was mm. being do you hit. have a treadmill at home i do do, you, do your dogs ever go on it no they they try and bite the treadmill oh, they don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah they won't feel the i was gonna wonder how hard is that to, to teach a dog because i've seen dogs on videos doing i that. thought about getting one to do that too just because yeah my dog could always use a, a good run or a walk and yeah, it's the same thing. It's it's just such a reflection on you and your own uh, habits and, and getting them out and, and being active that it totally affects them. And it, it affects the, the energy that they have that's just, it's just, I mean, they, they want to express it. And if you're not letting them express it, it's like shit happens like he'll eat stuff just randomly like, oh no no your dog has add he needs medication dude he just, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. how funny is that right no, that 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 could very well be like in the future people get medication to calm of down course and, hey yeah. my dog my dog's chewing on the furniture yeah and you know he's acting crazy oh and here give him some Adderall. yeah the vet's like oh yeah. he needs he's got he's got a, you know a, you know dog add so give him some medication oh, instead of God. asking you do you walk your dog because <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah you get your dog out yeah you know what i'm saying you uh, know we, we we answered a quiet not to shift gears on us from dogs and stuff like that but you, I just thought of something that I wanted to bring up on the show because <clears throat> I think it's just important to as a reminder for people that are trying to get fit and get back in shape or that are struggling mentally like because they're they're physically not there and we answered a question about what's more important like getting you know mentally fit first or physically fit mm-hmm. first like or, or you know and you were talking about how they yeah. work together you know and I was just we we just left where do we go Katrina and I just went out of town for the weekend oh back to the valley to go see my buddies and I got out of the car to go pump gas. And like that morning we got up early and we trained already and stuff and I'm hitting the road and, and I'm, and I catch myself getting out of the car and walking and I can feel myself kind of the way I'm walking with my chest up, my shoulders back. I can feel my glutes firing when I'm walking as my leg, I trained my legs really hard, like two mm-hmm. days before. 
And for a split moment, I caught the the feedback loop. I caught the way the just the walking on the ground, the feeling of the, my posture, to actually feeling all my muscles. And I felt my myself smile and uh-huh. my mood all like instantly change. And I got in the car and I actually said something to Katrina. I said, you know, make sure I remind me to to bring this up on the podcast with the boys because I think it's so 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 important that it's stuff that we just you don't really think about that. We get so caught up in the oh I need to lose thirty pounds and the exercise thing and I want to look this way and do all these things like that. And you know, there's there's such a major major benefit to training and exercise consistently and those little things that you don't would never thought like that potentially could set my trajectory for the rest of the day you know and w- my interaction well, with my friends and my girl and well here's what here's what happens so when you when you do something good when you uh, have good interactions with people when you feel better when you accomplish more at work you're more likely to have more good things happen. You know how they always say, um, you know, what you what you put out, you attract or whatever. Right, right. Well, scientifically speaking, that's true because if I let's just look at business for example. If I do something in business and I succeed, more people are more likely to give me more chances or give me money to invest or buy my stuff, which then helps me succeed more, which then gets me. And this is why success tends to look like a hockey stick, where you just this acceleration and the drop looks like that too, where. If I do something really bad, less likely, less people are less likely to help me and all that stuff, right? So when you look at your life, if you start to feel good, if you start to take care of yourself, that may be a small change in your trajectory today, but every day that trajectory gets, that angle becomes steeper and steeper and larger and larger to where a month from now, six months from now, a year from now, you're very, very different than you would have been had you not made some of those changes. The other thing too is we pervert we really, really pervert terribly what health we have for a long time, what health actually means. And so we're so focused on, like you said, on, you know, uh, how we look and, you know, you know, do, 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 am I lean? Am I muscular? All these different things that we pervert it so much that we miss the, the, the real the big root. stuff. I said this to Katrina when I get in the car and her response was, uh, she's like, you got to bring it up because she said, it's so funny you say this because I just had a conversation with um, our niece and our niece is like 26 years old, real successful girl. What she does, she's the one that lives over in New York. And she's constantly going up and down with her weight all the time. And she knows what to do and stuff like that. It's just a matter of being consistent. And she said that they had a really good conversation this last week together about this. And, and she's like, you know, Auntie, what is it? You know, how do you stay in such good shape all the time? All the hours that you work with Adam and all the hours you work at your job and you still, you always look amazing. You always maintain this great shape. She goes, you know, honestly... She goes, most of my life, I did it completely wrong, but yet I still kind of maintained it. But that I was motivated like an athlete, you know, to, to stay stay fit and to train hard. And like I pushed myself that way, almost like I would punish myself to stay in shape. And she goes, about five years ago, Adam really helped me connect to all the other things that nobody ever really talks about. She goes, you know, he, he started to make me really pay attention to you know, my mood and my energy level throughout the day and my attitude towards my coworkers and, you know, her productivity level and her ability to think clearly and everything, our information she's retaining and all these other carryovers that we get from training. And she goes, you know, I realized like, whoa, what a better human I was on all aspects of my life. So, you know, maybe you're not much of a workout person, but you're passionate about work or you're passionate about reading or you're passionate about art. You're passionate about something else in your life. It's amazing when you're taking care of your body, how it repays you on all these other things that you claim are so important to you. So if you can learn to make the connection to that, opposed to this like, oh, I'm 30 pounds overweight or I need to look a certain way or being so attached to that, she goes, it becomes a lot easier to stay in quote unquote shape. She goes, because now I don't think about like, oh, I need to go to the gym because I need to lose 15 pounds. She goes, I need to go to the gym because I can see my attitudes changing. I can see my sleep isn't as good as it was. I can see that I'm not as motivated. I'm not as happy. Like, And I want to take care of myself. Yeah. And I want, and I want all those things. I want to be happy. I want to have good conversations. I want to have good relationships. I want to be productive at work. Now you've tied that in as a a process, right? So the workouts, so the workouts, a solution to that. So yeah, I think a lot of people like they, they haven't looked at working out as that. Right. They've always looked at it as just like this punishment mentality. Or, or I, have, I have to get in shape and I look like shit. So I need to, I need to do something about or it. Or it's just to change how I look. Yeah. That's what it's all, you know, it's usually the, what it's about. That's right. And you know, here's the thing. Instead of enhancing the rest of your life, well, here's which is thing. what it really does. Exactly. Yeah. And if, if, if everybody in, if everybody in, in, in the world was just 
healthy, right? They would look healthy. That's the thing that people need to understand. You, you'll look the way you want if you just take care of yourself like you care about yourself. If you just focus on being healthy. And health is a huge umbrella. Mm-hmm. It, is, your weight, is your weight a signal that can tell you some stuff about your health? Yes, it is. But it's one. There's no, you can't possibly read your health with one signal. That's impossible. That's only one piece of information on this human organism that's extremely complex. So look at the whole thing, become healthy, and what'll happen is you'll surprise yourself. You'll look in the mirror and be like, oh shit, I actually look good because I'm healthy. I don't look good because I'm just trying to look good. I look good because I'm actually trying to be healthy. I talk about this on every single, almost every podcast that ever interviews me. They like to bring this this up with me. And I, I try to explain to them like, you know, I think we have this mentality that we're destined to just overeat. We're destined to be inactive because that's what our bodies want to do. And we've, there's this narrative that we've been told that because humans evolved in scarcity, if we have food in front of us, we'll just eat the fuck out of it until yeah. we kill ourselves. Well, part of that problem like, is like too, animals, part which of that, is not true. Part of that problem, and this goes back to some of the things I helped Katrina with, is, you know, hey, if you want pizza or you want to go drinking, fine, do those things. But don't ignore what your body tells you after you do that. Right. Like it feels great at that moment. The first time that pizza hits your mouth and it goes down, stuff like that. Indulgence always does. Right, right. Yeah. So don't just connect to that. Connect to all the other signals that come from that. Pay then pay close attention to your just next. Just have all the information. Yeah, exactly. And just, then you can make better decisions. Right, and then just yeah. see how often you want that. And then you then you find it a lot easier to not indulge in those things because you, right away, instead of thinking about, oh my God, that pizza tastes so good, you go... I'll probably be on the shitter in about two hours. Yeah. I probably won't get the best sleep tomorrow. The next day, it'll probably affect my my attitude at work and my sleep. I may not get even get my workout in because I'll feel lethargic. I'm going to hold a bunch of water, so I'm going to feel puffy. And you start thinking of all the other things that, that come with that. Right, right. And then it doesn't become this, I can or can't have the pizza. It becomes like, I don't know if I really yeah, want it. Really like, as a- good as it sounds right now, yeah. watching this watching this UFC fight... Do I still got a lot of shit that's more important to me tomorrow right. than it this? It just reminds home. me of this mentality I feel like like society has had for a long period of time, where it's just like a numbing thing. Like they want to like disassociate themselves with with their own with what their body's telling them, or the quiet and the stillness in their mind because they don't want to listen or look at themselves in the mirror. They don't they don't want to like acknowledge their self. And, well, it's and another coping really going me- on me- yeah. mechanism for sure. Absolutely, it is, it is. But it's it's look, and you you may at that point when you have because. Whenever you make a decision, the best thing you could possibly do is have all the available information that you can have on making that decision. Then you're more likely to make a good decision. So in the in the example that Adam gave with pizza, you 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 understand all these things. At first it takes you a second because you got to pay attention to them, but at some point it becomes kind of automatic. And then you can decide with the right decision to eat the pizza or not. Because it doesn't mean you'll never eat the pizza. Sometimes you're going to be you in a situation. Eat the pizza. Yeah, sometimes you're going to be a situation where you're like, okay, I'm going to feel crappy. I'm not going to sleep well. I'm going to have this and that. I'm going to hold water, but I'm with my friends. I don't see them a lot. I really want to enjoy the taste of this. We're having a great time. Okay, it's worth it. I think I'll. Yeah. I'll and you're making a better decision. That's all you're. That's all you're doing. But back to the, you know, humans just eat whatever the fuck's in front of them and never want to move. And that's our natural instinct. That's false too. Because here's the bottom line. Overeating and stuffing yourself and getting sick is not ev- evolutionarily advantageous. It yeah, never has it been. It doesn't feel good. It never has been. We have built into us, built into us, natural ba- natural barriers that tell you when to stop eating, when to keep eating, when to make a different food choice. You just can't hear them because yeah. we're fucking Ignored confusing them. them with all this food that's designed to do that. Like, mm-hmm. how can I possibly listen to the signals of my body when the food I'm eating is designed and processed to override that shit because that's what they're trying to do. They're making it as palatable as possible, which, you know, is going to make me want to eat more. It's not hard to eat 2,500 calories worth of potato chips, but it's very difficult to eat 2,500 calories of whole natural foods that are right in front of you. It's very difficult. That, and that's your body's natural signal. And so one of the best things you could do, eliminate processed foods and then listen to your body. Mm-hmm. And people are like, how do I listen to your body? Just try it out. You will naturally start to see. Oh, why do you think the whole thirty is such an exploding that's it. thing? Right. I mean, that's why everybody. That's what it is. Everyone's on that. It's like, dude, oh my god, this is so life changing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we've been saying this you message for a long time. From that's, processed food. That's yeah. right. That's right. And so you know, and this goes. This is true for a lot of different things. We were just talking about ADD. Like, kids are. If you leave kids alone, 
what kids do very naturally is they play and they learn. That's what mm-hmm. kids do. And by the way, playing for kids is learning. Yeah. Kids are Thank children you, yes. are literal sponges. Like we need to we need to sit down and appreciate just how much they learn in a short period of time. It will blow away anything any of us can do. And I mean, think about that. A kid can go from not speaking to learning a language in, in 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 the intricacies of it and understanding it in a very very short period of time. They can under, They can at the same time learn you know, motor mechanics and learn how to walk and crawl and do all these things. They can grow their bodies all within the same period of time. They are literal sponges. What they want to do is learn. And a lot of their learning is through movement and play. And so when you take that shit away and you say, sit down in this chair right. and fucking le- learn what I want you to learn, not what you want to learn. What are you going to get? A bunch of kids that are going to, and then you on top of it, you feed them yeah. a bunch of crazy food and all this other stuff. What do you think is going to happen? You're going to have a bunch of symptoms that look and like- And you're evaluating how they're like deficient in all these you know, ways of learning, whereas like it's really, it's the educator that needs to assess that. Like, why am I not getting through? Oh, you're, fi- you're fitting a square peg yeah. in a round hole all of a sudden. Oh, that doesn't fit. You're how do we make it fit? You're communicating to yeah. Yeah, what they, how they even learn. You're not even going into that process. Exactly. And so I, I think really it's not as complex as we, I think the complex part is the behavior change part. That's always very difficult, but I think once people understand it and start to take those steps and the behaviors start to change, I really think that we, we may be the potential for a, a real health revolution in, in a real sense. I think the potential is higher today than it ever has been. I really, really am pretty hopeful. I, I see that the information is out there. I think people now have been exposed to some of it for long enough. I think now we've had a few generations that have suffered the consequences, so people see now like, oh, okay. That causes this. I don't want to do that. Uh, one of the reasons why the I generation is different than millennials, I think they learn from the previous generation of things they should and shouldn't do. And I think that we may be on the, in, the, in the beginning of a, a real – we're also realizing that Western medicine doesn't have all the answers. You know what I mean? We're realizing yeah. like, okay, I can't just go to the doctor, get a pill, and now I'm better because yeah. it's now just – Now i got all these other things to worry about. Yeah, and so I think we may be – in the beginning of an actual real kind of health revolution. And I, I'm seeing who's the popular voices that are talking about health and fitness and wellness. They're starting to, they're, the message is starting to become one that I'm sh- like saying, okay, that's not too bad of a message. It used to be yeah. <laughs> the message was terrible, 100%. Now yeah. I'm hearing people, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Like Max Lugavere has been on Dr. Oz and doing those other things. And he's got like decent information. Whole30 is one of the first. You just brought them up, right? It's one yeah. of the first like mainstream diets. That's good. I've never. How do you remember ever seeing a mainstream diet no, where you could read and be like, like, "Oh, it's, cool, good. I'm glad you're doing that." It's right. the yeah. first. Yeah. yeah, it's the first mainstream diet that uh, if a client came to me and said something like, "Hey, I'm doing that. What do you think?" Like, absolutely. Like, hey, I think that's a great, a great thing to protocol. It's a great to start. Great yeah, place it's a to, great yeah. place yeah. to start. Great protocol for you to follow. You can learn a lot from that. Yeah, yeah. If you want structure, like, yeah. do that. But anyway, I'm I'm just excited because I see, uh, you know, what this 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 revolution is starting to uh, create, and I see it in our space. It's happening in all spaces, and I'm excited. I'm really excited for it because I feel like, uh, you know, our growth and evolution is accelerating at such a pace that within a generation or two, I think we're going to see huge changes in the way we learn and approach things, and the way we discuss things. Yeah. And um, I couldn't be I couldn't be happier. I am so excited. I'm so happy that old media is dying and is going to be dead yeah, soon. It's be you, antiquated. You can see them start to grasp at everything they possibly can though. Like the the, the <laughs> well, sound like bites you brought up with with the advertisement space now, right? And you're seeing it for streamings in like, you know, it's it's just that's the writing on the wall right there. Right. You know, like it's it's there. This quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MindPump for 20% off at checkout. All right, first up, Cell Carp. I'm a female with very developed trap muscles. My job as a dental hygienist has me in a very shrugged shoulders position most of the day. What are some exercises or stretches to help enhance the other muscles around it and decrease trapezius involvement? You know, there's a there's a lot of that's a very common area people get tight is yeah. in the uh, in the upper trapezius. And part of that is because people have really bad uh, shoulder recruitment patterns mm-hmm. uh, and mid-back sh- recruitment patterns because of forward shoulder. 
So they're they're unable to activate the muscles that pull the shoulders back. You did together. a really good YouTube and video now, on this. Yeah, we did a forward shoulder uh, solution video where I talked about some of this. It's common because uh, we you know we sit at desks, we're on our phones, we're on computers, everything's in front of us. We reach everything in front of us. Yeah. So so what happens is the shoulder blades kind of lose the ability, or we to lose the ability to bring them back mm -hmm. and to bring and to and to, to depress them or bring them down. And so what happens is the next available muscle tries to take over to stabilize the shoulder girdle, mm -hmm. and that's the upper trap up near your, your neck. And so people get really tight there. They get tight shoulders. They get tight. They get headaches. And one of the ways people try to alleviate that is with massage, where somebody will press down on their traps and loosen them up, and the, the which is okay, but it's the problem temporary. with that, yeah, it's temporary. It's, it helps him. It releases, calms the central nervous system down, and it makes you relax. That's why it feels so good. But then, then it just goes right yeah. back to what, where it was because you didn't fix it. You're so you're not programming, dude. It. You know the biggest game changer personally for me with this was, and it was way later in my training career was incorporating the farmer carries. Yes, farmer carry. This is like farmer carries, and the reason why I think as a trainer it didn't the light bulb didn't really go off for me is because when you just do, when you do them one time, they don't feel like a major exercise. Like you do farmer carries and like you feel most like, uh, isometric exercises, right? You do it and you're just like, this isn't really, this isn't really like, doing what is much. This doing? Yeah. yeah, like my forearms are getting work. Like, what am I working a little bit of my legs because I'm carrying this? Like, I don't feel like I'm building muscle or working like I should. But it's such a great movement because it counters a lot of the issue that you're dealing with right here, and it helps you keep that in that uh, depressed and retracted position. So that was something that I wish. I incorporated more with my clients as a young trainer, and it wasn't until later in my career that I did I find that movement so beneficial. Now, I'm gonna have to well, I'm gonna have to disagree with the, the exercise selection for this particular area, and here's why. Oh, really? Yeah, and here's why. When you're walking with uh, with weights in your hands at your sides, the muscles that are supporting are the ones that are fighting gravity, which would be the upper traps, because and even if you're trying to keep it depressed your traps have to stabilize because they're fighting gravity up. In this situation, I'd want to work the opposite direction. I'd want to work muscles that pull the shoulders down and back and not strengthen. Because if you do farmer carries a lot, you're going to get really strong traps. Like You're, tra you're not going to get lats. You're not you may get some rhomboids. Oh, that's interesting you're going to debate this. I, I'm going to continue to disagree with you here, dude. I mean, it's because it is. It's an isolation exercise. It's not like you're doing repetitions of – of working the traps. Well, it's like not that. isolation. It's functional. You're moving. Well, you're it's functional because you're moving, but you're keeping the traps and, and the and the scapula in a, in a isolated position. In a in a and you're teaching it to be in that position, solid with a little bit of resistance. So you have to hold it in that position. What's holding their shoulders down is the weight is helping you bring your shoulders down because mm. the weight is pulling you down, and so the mm. opposing muscle that by nature has to activate is the one that fights Interesting. that weight. Yeah. So, you see what I'm saying? Well, because I, I see I was going more scapular, uh, ar articulated circle. So if I'm hanging and then I'm going through like a, a scapular circle. While you're hanging? Well, yeah, just because yeah. we've lost connection with our scapula at, at that point to where I'm trying to regain the ability to then – feel where I need to I need to move and pull my shoulders back and then pin them down like I have to literally like take my body through that process of being able to do that but I, then again I see like holding static weight to then sort of prompt me as like a tool to get me to uh, understand where my shoulders need to be and then squeeze my way into it and like really connect to that isometrically so well yeah because you're thinking of this too is Part of why someone's rolled forward in the traps is they're, they're overactive. They're just being fired. They're in a tense, in a state of tonus, right? We say all the time. So they're elevated. You holding on to some weights is going to help pull that back into that position. This person may not do very well doing that, just going through a normal exercise. You do circles, which I'm I'm pro circles, but that's so. Let me give you. Let me give you later another, for me. Let like, me give you another example. Let's say you want to correct someone's posture because they have forward shoulders, and I and I've used your theory of putting them in the right position. So I put a like brace on them that holds their shoulders back for them. Different. 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 How? Because you're do you're actively doing it yourself. Okay, so what you're doing with with farmer walks is the weight is pulling you down. Cuz technically and you're trying to also go down with the weight. So what muscle has to stabilize? No, 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 you're not. You're not doing that. Well, you're you still not, have to be retracted. Yeah, you're re the retracted part. I get, but the fact that you're you're also resisting it. You're not just letting it hang there. You're you're act. You're being active. It's, and, and the muscles that are resisting, so pulling back, I see the mid back, but also the mu muscles that are resisting are the upper traps. Whereas if I'm hanging from a bar, 
and I have to pull down. Now I'm opposing yeah. the traps, and the traps are relaxing, and I'm strengthening Problem the muscles. Problem with that, you know how it, you, that's a hard exercise. You're you asking, lap bar. yeah, exactly. You're asking someone to activate an area that has been neurologically gone to sleep. Yeah, I would go with. That's, the, I mean, that's why. So you could you, do it with you, the lap bar. You doing farmer walks first. To me, it wakes that area up. It's like, and yes, you're using a tool to do that. You're using weight, so it's not. So you are using assistance to get them in that position. So I wouldn't stop there. It's not the uh. end of it, but I think it's a great place. Some people can't even get themselves in that retracted yeah. press position. You ask someone to pull down on that, they're going to pull with their arms. No, you. They're, they're going to default to their. Want to be functional with it too, like so she's going to be raising her arms all day, right? Like working and, and having mm -hmm. her arms like elevated, and so to be able to. Understand understand now how to retract and depress in that same position is is you know ultimately the most important so you know something like shoulder raises but like you have to learn the the pattern of being able to retract and depress and that has to become something that yeah like patterned. a like a prone That's, cobra when it's taught really well is actually really good at this no prone cobra yeah. it's probably I, one of the best pro, like, beginner ones. yeah prone cobra and i love the farmer i love the farmer walks and then i like what you're saying as far as the circles and stuff like that but I mean, again, that that now you're asking them to call upon that muscle that they they've gone to sleep for probably years and years of their life. So, and then I would probably do a seated row with a seated row with an emphasis on retraction and depression and a hold at the every end. Yeah, so you're that's gonna a row one. in, that's retract, a depress, hold Absolutely. for three to five seconds, come out, and so you're just teaching that person because where where she needs to be aware of this is what, like Justin was starting to show with her hands forward and working on someone's teeth all day long. She's automatically going to go to that default right. protract forward and, and elevate. Yeah. And she needs to know what that feels. That she needs same to know what that pattern. feels like to be locked in back yeah. and shoulders back like that. And man, you get her used to carrying 30, 50, 60 pound, 100 pound dumbbells like that. I tell you what, like she'll, you're, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna, gonna, gonna. I think what'll happen is she'll get really tight trap. I mean, think about it this way: what if when you do farmer walks, what muscles are you working the most? What muscles do you feel sore? What muscles you develop the most? From farm, and it's hard to, you're not gonna say once, it's hard to isolate because it's not an isolation right. movement, but that's a fucking trap. Mm. You are, you are gonna get some traps doing heavy farmer walks. What you, what you might not wanna do, and there's nothing wrong with working traps if they're overactive, but in the beginning, you might not wanna do that. Like, I wouldn't do any shrugs or anything that activates the traps because she already knows how to turn those fuckers on. They're turned on all the time. I wanna show her how to turn them off, and the only way to show her well, is to the activate them. So, yes, yes, and, yes yeah. and no, she's, she's, they're turned on in one direction right now. Mm. And you're and you're you're waking it up in the opposite direction. Right now, she's got it to the where opposite it, direction would be the muscles that oppose it. Like the, the traps contract in one direction. I hear what you're saying. You're talking about putting them in a more lengthened position and adding resistance to that. And you know, but here's the thing: like when someone's really really tight in a muscle, it, it, and we're talking about a dysfunction. I'm not just talking about your everyday you know run of the mill like okay your posture is bad. She's talking about like really really developed. They're probably really tight. I wouldn't want to work them at all, at least for the first you know couple months. Well, I most certainly wouldn't be doing shrugs with her. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean that, that's a there's no way I'm doing shrugs yeah, with yeah. her. But uh, farmer walks and getting her in that position that and that posture, hundred percent prone cobras. Yes, prone cobras got to be the best. Seated one. row retraction to depression. I mean, hundred percent. I'm. I'm. I guess doing a good rule things. of thumb is work the if whatever muscles tight, work the muscles that do the opposite to try and get that muscle to. To, to relax and then find out what your what your your deviation is and just try to correct that because here's the deal like if her back if her back muscles her scapula her shoulder was moving the way it was supposed to she wouldn't have this issue yeah you know what I mean well she, uh, just understanding uh, like your daily patterns and like how to how to more effectively create better patterns within that movement so you know, if you have your arms up quite a bit and you're leaning over, how can you do that where you're consciously bracing, you know, your spine and staying more neutral and also, um, you know, putting your shoulder in a position where it's more favorable. So you're developing, um, you know, more, more mus muscular involvement that stabilizes it the way it's supposed Dude, to. Dude, check this out. So my, my, my daughter the other day comes up to me and she goes, hey, you know, because we brought her to my dad's house and my dad watched it. My dad was doing stuff in the backyard. So the kids were inside doing whatever they wanted. And, you know, what do you think the kids tend to decide to want to do all day when they have the choice to be on a computer, right? Mm -hmm. So she was on her computer all day and I come pick her up and she's like, oh, she's like, Papa, my, my back hurts. You know, my daughter's eight years old. I'm like, where does your back hurt? And I knew where it was, but I wanted her to point it out. And she's like, oh, it's, you know, up here. So she's pointing to like her trap area and she's like, and down here, her lower back area. 
And so I'm trying to explain to her, well, you know, you're sitting in a particular position for a long period of time. Muscles are staying tight. Other muscles aren't working. And so when your body's not moving the way it wants to or the way it should, I should say, um, you're going to cause some of these pain problems. So I showed her how to change her posture while she's sitting at the you know computer. Mm-hmm. I was like, pull in your belly button every mm-hmm. once in a while. Pull your shoulders down. Sit nice and tall. Sometimes change positions. Lay on your stomach instead of sitting in a chair, sit in on the floor. And so it's just crazy that I'm having this conversation with an eight year old. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's yeah, it's it's insane, really. Yeah. I mean, like, well, how that it starts that young, but it's it it seems like that's just the environment that we've created. You know, now we have to figure out how to address this early enough, so it's not like something that just patterns all the way I think, through. Adulthood. I think you're going to see a huge move for movement where there's going to be giving so many kids are being giving specific exercises for this particular area. Like, well, well there needs to be that. I'll yeah, go yeah, even further and say that it'll get it'll get mandated in schools real yeah. soon here, the way that the chairs and the way that things are sitting in when they when we start to see that we just haven't seen it yet, dude. It hasn't been around long enough. I know. It mm-hmm. hasn't been around long enough to do some serious fucking dis- dysfunction, man. I tell yeah. you what, you were in the next 10, 15 years when these kids that well, were the market's gonna demand it. I mean you saw even Apple's already having to address the fact that, oh, well, our phones are like addictive? Weird. You know, like, <laughs> let's put a little thing on here yeah. to to monitor that. You know yeah. what makes me so upset too is there's so like the cigarette warning. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's what that is. Dude, have like, you seen like, dude? <laughs> have you seen cigarette warnings in Europe? They have a picture on the cigarette pack of like some fucked up ass teeth or someone with like a you know, with those tubes in the throat, and it's yeah. like, can't like it causes this or whatever. I'm like, whoa, like, that's holy strong. Shit, that was a jump. Yeah. That's strong. <laughs> the irony, though, is I think they've done studies on that. It didn't didn't deter anybody from it, right? Um, uh, I don't know about that. I know that ta- like, increasing the, the taboo of it. Yeah, like, people uh, are still like it, assholes. Yeah. I know less people smoke in the U.S. than ever before. But the the here's the part that pisses me off about the kids thing. You see a lot of kids now without backpacks that go on their shoulders. Mm. Everybody has the rolling backpacks. Do you know why? Because they tried to address the back and neck pain uh, thing by saying, oh, it's your backpack. Oh, it's your backpack that's doing it. So bring a fucking backpack that rolls on the floor. <laughs> Not completely missing on yeah. the real reason why yeah. right. their shoulders hurt. That's so crazy. So stupid. The irony is the backpack would probably do a little bit of right? good. It's, it's, it's <laughs> walk with some resistance. Gonna prompt you yeah. Yeah, in a yeah. retracted position. Yeah. <laughs> that's hilarious. Next question is from Lolo Cool J. Can you discuss the differences in body composition, namely body fat percentage, between men and women? In our forum the other day, there was a uh, ex-competitor. So this young lady competed several times before, would get really, really lean, very fit. And more recently, she said she put on like 20 or 30 pounds, which, by the way, is not a lot of weight considering how lean some of these female competitors get. Like They get so shredded that putting on 20 pounds... They're still ten of it's healthy. Yeah, they're still relatively <laughs> right. lean. You know what I mean? So she's she wrote this whole post and she said, It's weird. I was so lean before, so fit before, or whatever, because I was doing those competitions. And now that I've put on, and I don't remember what she said, I think it was 20 or 30 pounds. When I put on this weight, way more men are flirting and hitting on me. And she's like, Duh. what the hell's going on? Like what, what what's happening? And so some of the people commenting were like, Oh, sometimes when you're really fit, you're hard to approach and people feel self conscious, this and that. And I'm like, no, I'm like, <laughs> you're you just look healthy. Yeah, you're promoting health, which is more attractive. You 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 know, and you look more fertile, and uh, you know, healthy and fertile is always more attractive to more people than yeah, non fertile and unhealthy. Subconsciously, even if we think that, we think the other way yeah. it looks cooler. Like, oh, that looks badass. Well, but it's like, like exaggerated is always eye catching, right? So like that's why I think Instagram people like. Uh, We've met them in real life, and like their features are so exaggerated. And then you see them, and you're like, "Oh, whoa, shit!" You know, it's like, "What is going on here?" Like, it's not natural. No, to where like seeing somebody that's naturally beautiful and and looks healthy and vibrant, way more attractive. And so, my point with this is, this is asking the difference between body composition. Well, here's the deal: what is considered lean and healthy in a man is very different than what's considered lean and healthy in a woman. And men can get much much leaner and still appear to have good health whereas women really don't have this they, they can't get super shredded with that in fact their period will and that's a good signal by the way when you stop having your period thank you for saying yeah that. your yeah. body now is telling you uh hey you know we don't think you you can have a child right we don't think you're in a he- healthy enough situation to have a child yeah it's i mean it's it's a natural signal that's like you know like, let, let's address this you know this might be a little too far yeah so i'd say for a man you know a healthy lean 
body fat, would you guys agree, is probably between 9 to 12 percent? Yeah. For most, yeah. that's a good range, right? That's a good lean range. That's a good lean range. Yeah. What do you guys think would be a good lean range for women? I, I, I'm thinking like lean, lean would be like 18, 18 19, yep. yeah. and maybe up to like 24. So my yeah. trainers, that, my female trainers that I that I had for like the last core that Justin worked with, I thought were some of the fittest, most balanced like women that we had like working. Sorry, honey, but I totally agree. Yeah, <laughs> they were, <laughs> they were, they were on point and they all carried themselves. So I used to, we used to do body fat competitions and stuff like that all the time with the staff. And my, my girls that worked for me kept themselves between 18 and 21%. And I think that was like a, it was, it's a great look. It's a healthy look on them. They still look lean, but then they also have curves to them. They don't look emaciated. They don't look like they're hungry. They, they have their period still. Yeah, they have their period yeah. still. Everything's normal. So I think for females somewhere, and now mind you too, we say a number like that and everybody's different. Like Katrina, you know, she has to be like sub 10% for her to look like she's super lean and shredded. She's, since the day I've met her, have, have kept, carried herself between 12 and 15% body fat. And when you look at Katrina right now, I mean, she's probably about 13% body fat. She doesn't look that crazy lean. So some people carry their body. There is a big variance. Yeah, there. there is there is definitely a variance there too and exceptions to rules. So when we talk about numbers like this, I want to, I just want it's to general. Yeah, tell people that it's a general and you can be the exception to the rule. And you can be very healthy in a pretty wide range. You know, this was a good, this is a good thing to talk about too, is that you can be a man and be, and have just as good a health at, 17% body fat as you would have at 10 or 11%. You know, this body is fat. something that I have to continually remind myself. Yeah. So this is something that I I still struggle with, you know, being completely transparent that, you know, because I've seen myself in incredible shape and like I know what like badass fit me looks yeah. lo looks like. But when I really think about like even where I'm at right now, I'm probably sitting at if I had to guess, um I'm probably about 14% body fat. And and pretty goddamn he healthy. Like I've got, I'm eating three times a day. I'm, you know, stepping ten to fifteen thousand steps. Like every once in a while, I do a little cardio bout to make sure that I got some cardiovascular endurance. Like doing my mobility. I'm like I'm some of the, I'm as mobile as I've ever been in my life. But mentally, I still have this goal where I want to be look mm -hmm. look mm -hmm. a certain way. But in reality, I'm probably. Some of the healthiest. You're pretty close to yeah, where you want to be. Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty close to being some of the healthiest I've ever been, even though I have this aesthetic goal that I want to to go after. And part of that, I think, is, you know, it's my own fault and how I view my own is my own issues and stuff like that. But then, you know, we we always promote this this healthy body or this healthy look on Instagram and social media and imagery. It's shredded. And average, shredded. And, yeah. Like that's like like that that's really healthy and it's like no that's actually closer to unhealthy mm -hmm. than that look on some guy or girl that we look at and we're not impressed yeah, with i can feel it for me and this is again this is different from person to person but for me i can feel when my health starts to take a little bit of a dip even if i'm doing everything quote unquote right when i get below seven percent eight to seven percent right around there i can start to feel like okay I can, I'm getting leaner, You're which, you know, it it, I'm shredded. I get the striations and all that stuff, but I can tell like it's diff My sleep is a little different. My energy is a little different. I feel like my hormones are different. Um, I look in the face, in, in the mirror, and my face starts to look more gaunt. And people, you know, my parents were great at like, letting me know about that, by the <laughs> way. I'll show up and my mom will be like, oh my God, I'm going to feed you. Your face is, <laughs> you look so old. So, and I, 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 I and it, it's because I'm, I start to enter into that like less healthy, you know, body fat percentage. Now, for women, this is higher. Typically, this is a higher place to be. And I really, and I think women suffer more from the whole shredded Instagram thing because if you're a man and you want a six pack, you can be very healthy and get a six pack. If a woman wants to get a six pack, for a lot of women, in order to do that, you got to get to a certain leanness that's probably not ideal for you. It's probably well, that, not yeah, a good leanness. Katrina's an example. Is that's why I meant by, so she carries herself at 12%. You can't see like her defined abs mm. like that. So she's got to be sub 10% for her to see that, which is technically not a healthy place. No, for no. Be. It is very different from birth. Yeah. And some people walk around at a higher body fat percentage and, and are, you know, very healthy. I've known, you know, I've had female clients that were in the mid twenties of body fat, which isn't high. It's just not super lean, you know, like 25%. They looked amazing. They felt very, very good. Health was excellent. They had good performance in the gym. There was really no need to push it any any harder with the leanness. 
So, the, and this is this is just it's very important to talk about because I see so many people chasing that shredded body fat, you know, look. And I, you know, look, I I appreciate it too. Every once in a while, I'll do it just because I like the challenge of it, and I like to see, you know, what my body can. Oh, do. I think there's, I think there is definitely. I mean, we talk about with, with Andy Galpin, right, about is you know stress and adaptation mm-hmm. and the importance of optimize or yeah, adapt, right? Either optimizing or adapting, and you know, I do think there is. Uh, there's a lot to to learn from pushing your body to a, a new level, whatever that is. You know, so if you've never been, you know, fifteen percent, well, you getting down to fifteen percent. I think there's a lot of value mm-hmm. to that, and and learning what it takes to get there, and then also learning how your body feels when you're there, and then also paying attention to what's probably inevitable when you come back the other direction. Paying attention to those steps as you started to come back and how you felt also. So. It is funny because when you'd see, uh, you know, when you're when you're around competitors. You can ask men and women this, like when do, when do it, people who date a competitor ask them when they think that their 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 partner looks the most attractive? Guarantee you, it's not when they're in contest shape. It's probably a little bit off season, like after the contest, and they start to put on a little bit of water, a little bit of body fat, and they look healthier. That's when people tend to consider them most healthy. And it's and I'm not saying you need to look uh, a particular way. My point is is that. They, they they consider them attractive because they look healthier, right. because they look like they've put on a little bit of body fat and stuff. So, but that, I I think those are good ranges, right? To to kind of aim for for men between what do we say eight 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 percent to twelve percent yeah. for women, eighteen to like twenty four something like that. Probably a good range, I would say. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that and with the the knowing that there's an exception to the rule. Yeah, right? and you, oh, here's the well, thing. There always are. Here's an interesting statistic: uh, health issues that are associated with high body fat. In men starts to happen when you get around twenty percent, and in women starts to happen when you get around thirty percent or or a little over thirty percent. Once you start to get above twenty percent for a man, regardless of how good you are with your diet and everything, and everything's good. Uh, if your body fat's that high, you start to get some I thought it potential was, for negative. I thought it was even lower. I thought fifty. Once you're above fifteen percent, I thought they showed that the, the de- decrease in natural uh, testosterone. I don't know about that. No, I don't know. That's yeah, I, I believe that the. I, I think once you you hit over fifteen percent body fat, your your natural testosterone levels. Really? Yeah, look that up. I think it's. I think it's fifteen. I want to say it's fifteen okay. percent. But uh, yeah, no, it doesn't. I, I'm, I and for me, and of course, anecdotally speaking, I I can feel a, a major difference in me once I get to, you know, this sub. That's why I can tell. Like I told you guys, like I'm starting to feel. I'm getting my feel rhythm. Like yourself. Yeah, I'm starting to get like myself, and I know that's because I'm right. I'm I floating feel myself a lot. <laughs> I'm floating right around fourteen percent right now. Once I get like twelve ten, then I'm feeling really good, mm-hmm. and I can tell the difference. Next question is from it's just Dan Adam. Ah. During your road to pro, what were some of the major setbacks you faced and how did you overcome them? Wow. Okay. Um, well, there's there's a few that – there wasn't a lot, though. Um, I mean, I think that for the most part – What about the judging? I remember I, when uh, I read this question. Okay, so that's – When I read this, that's the first thing I thought. I was like, oh, fuck. Okay, so – okay. Maybe that makes you not want to keep pursuing it. Okay, so maybe if we look – so I was thinking of setbacks. Like I was trying to like evaluate my own training and like how I went about – you know, building my physique to become a pro. Um, I thought I, I thought show over show. I really believe that I'm, I, I made the improvements that I set out to do every single show. Um, I did have a setback, my second show, um, where I, I went from taking uh second, I was second and fourth, my very first show. And then my second show, I took six. It was one of the worst placings I had as an amateur and the setback and the, the mistake I made was taking more anabolics. Um, it's and part of the way I talk about this on the show about like, you know, that's kind of the answer for everybody. I kind of fell into that trap a little bit myself is I was taking a very minimal dose, uh, as an amateur before I even started competing, I had my therapeutic dose. And then when I started competing, I took it up to 250 milligrams of testosterone. And then my second show, because I didn't win, I thought, Oh, I'll, let me ramp up my testosterone a little bit more. And I took it up to like 400 milligrams a week of testosterone and the judges actually scored me lower. I thought I looked awesome. I, I, you know, because I got bigger and that was like what I wanted to do. And the judges actually looked at me and said, like, you look too much like a bodybuilder. And uh, that's why they wouldn't place me in the Were top. Were you like shocked? Did I you was, think for sure? I was like, pissed, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I thought I because because I improved my physique. So the way I was looking at it was, okay, I took second place in the, the, the last show um, or really fourth place in the overall uh, standings or whatever. Uh, so, or open, excuse me. 
So I was like, okay, I'm for sure going to take top two or top three because I improved my physique. But the improvement of my physique, I, I hit stage at like 201 on my first amateur show, and then I went 212 on my next one. So I gained like 11 pounds. And that was, I was as all lean. lean. Yeah, all lean mass. So I put on like 11 pounds of pure muscle between shows, and the judges were like, uh, too big looking. So then that, so that was a setback. So that, that, made me go back down to my my lower dosing of testosterone because I thought I, I put on too much uh, mass. And then I realized, like, okay, this is not a mass game for me. And I knew that it was about how, how shredded that I could be. Like, at that point, I had built a physique that was pretty balanced uh, as far as symmetry and stuff. And so, which I think is what most guys that are competing, uh, and girls too, a lot of them lose because they don't have good symmetry. Like they haven't put the time under the iron long enough. They decide that they want to do a show, and the, their 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 decision to want to get go to a show is the most consistency that they've ever done in the weight room. Which to me, I think that's a mistake that you make that a lot of people make trying that's to. That's a get great it. point. Yeah. So what they do, they this is very common right now where someone's like, "Oh man, my friend competed and she looked great, and I want to do it." And then, you know, you ask that person, like, you know, have you even strung together a year of training consistently? Like, have you ever done, like, literally, like, consistently, like, day in, day out for one year of your life? Like, if you haven't done that, like, what are you doing competing at? What are you doing competing at the competitive level? Like, you have so much more work to do. Like, I had put in 10, 12 years of really consistent training. So even though I didn't never had a a 3% body fat physique, I had sculpted a body already. I'd already been building my shoulders, building my chest, building so I had a good base. And there's a lot you learn in a long time under the iron that you just can't learn otherwise. No. The only way you can learn is by doing it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that could have been a setback and I see that as a setback for a lot of people is they get they get into uh, you know competing well before they've put the 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 time under the iron of of sculpting and building a, a body because really when you go into a prep uh, and I was just having this conversation this morning so it's funny we're going here. And I was telling Jessica, I was like, you know, the real work is done off season. The real work is done in you building a metabolism that's going to support your cut for 10, 12 weeks or however long you're cutting. Or in my case, I was only cutting six or eight weeks. That's a great statement. Yeah, because you you have to build a metabolism that is going to support a 12-week ex- starvation diet. Exactly. That's an excellent point. So I'm talking to a girl right now. Yeah, how many people have that going into a diet? Very few. Yeah, yeah. Nobody does. Right. That's and that's and it's 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 the that. wrong yeah. it's the wrong mentality going to the show. People think the hard part is the cut for the show. It's not. The hard part is building the physique that you've been probably hopefully busting your ass for for years and then building a metabolism to support a cut that's going to be anywhere between 6 to 14 weeks depending on how long your coach or you decide to do a cut for. And this is also why I used to get really fired up on this show about coaches that would even take clients on that are not in the right metabolic position to even get into a show. Mm -hmm. So if you're a girl and you're thinking about doing a show and you weigh 100 and say 130 to 150 pounds and you don't even consume 2000 calories and you want to get you want to compete for a show, get the fuck out of here. Like I'm I am I'm an irresponsible coach if I even fucking take your money. And that is so common right now because Dude, I've had clients come yeah. to me who are like, "Oh, my prep was 800 calories a day." It has to be. That's what happens <laughs> that when you come you come to a coach who wants to win and wants yeah. to take your body to the level you want to take it to and you come to me at 1500 calories or 1800 calories and you got to lose 15 to 20 pounds of body yeah. fat. Like yeah, we're not in. You're not in a healthy, uh, healthy metabolic position. So even though this was at my setback, and I know I'm going, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm on my soapbox right now because you just fired me up over something. But uh, some other setbacks that I had, you know, you mentioned judging. Like, hundred percent, this is, uh, you know, a subjective sport. You've got these other people that are you know, that may not like you or do like you. And so how you score. There's got to be a lot of politics. There, there is. There's a, there is a lot of politics coming. But that, that being said, you know, I'm a very competitive person. And part of me going pro was proving to myself that without the politics, remember, this is before Mind Pump. So I have no clout, no name. I don't have a team. I don't have a coach. I don't have any of these things. And I don't think I have a physique that's really, really ideal for bodybuilding, even though people chuckle when I say do, that. Do you think if you, let's say you had done this, but you also at the time had mind pump with the notoriety and stuff like that. I could see it helping, but I could also see it maybe hurting. <laughs> yeah, it would hurt. You think it would hurt you? It would hurt because we yeah. talk so much shit. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, then again, though, there's, I know I've ran in, so I recently, not that long ago, was a backstage at a show 
and I uh, I ran into some of the judges and that have now everyone's heard of Mind Pump a lot. Most of them have heard of Mind Pump now, and some of them are fans and like the show, mm-hmm. and so they're they're positive about it and they think it's great or whatever like that. Yeah, because I but, think social media clout now plays a little bit of a role because before it was like oh this guy uh, yeah. is popular in the magazines we're going to place him a little higher so this is what a lot of people right. don't know is that these guys these these organizations look for this now like right? they you know they're already before when these when the when you sign up right for a show they, they're going back and they're looking at all these people's social media presence and you know bottom line is if it's it's the sport if you're if you're good looking if you have a large social media following if you're connected to a team all those fucking things help out. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean that a guy like me or a person who doesn't have any of those things can't come in and still win, because I did. But I tell you what, I think I, I was at a disadvantage. I think that it was much more challenging for me than it was for- You also had to show your face a few times before they even acknowledged. Right. You know what I mean? Because I, I remember, who was it that told us that they didn't even want to place you as the overall winner because it was your first- Yeah. No, I had I had judges tell me that. In fact, we talked. I actually talked to a guy who judged my very first show and thought I deserved first place- and was getting, they got in an argument about me. So this was a really cool story that was told to me years later after I competed in talking to one of the main judges and him telling me that he absolutely thought I should have won the show and then somebody else didn't like who I was, never had seen me before and was like, we can't, we can't give him win now. He has to come back another time. And so that was kind of the argument. And he was like, it's too, he's, he's clearly better than everybody else that's on there. We can't not put him through and so they put me one position out which fourth place i can't qualify you have to be third or higher to qualify See, for the next level. Bullshit. right so you have to be ready for all these things and be okay with yeah. that as far as the setbacks with you know judging things like that but as far as like you know it's it's hard i didn't really have you a were, lo- you're, here's the thing so like the the setbacks with diet and exercise you were a trainer for decades you or over a decade you you know managed trains you worked with clients you've trained your body for so long like you probably got through all those setbacks before. Yeah, you know what I mean. I trained competitors before even yeah. I, I trained competitors before I competed. Now I don't think I was as good of a coach as I am. I am now. Like, but I mean, I've I had a lot of experience ar- around the space. A lot of my buddies were already pros. I was seeing what they were doing. I actually saw how wide open it was for a guy like me to come in and, and do really well because many of these young guys that were getting into it at the amateur level really were just clueless about what they're doing to the point where they hired a coach who they thought was really good and I knew who the coach really was. I knew their level of education, their experience. Like, that guy's an idiot. Yeah, and I was like, dude, this guy's... I, I know that I don't know a lot of this sport. Like, I'm not trying to come in and say I know a ton, but I know that I know enough that that guy doesn't know that... I know 10 times more than that guy knows about nutrition, mechanics, and things like that. So it's like, okay, there's definitely room for a Bro, guy. Bro, I've seen... I've seen I, I, I had a client send me their diet that they were given. Okay, and it consisted of chicken, broccoli, and then the occasional like quarter cup of oatmeal, and that was it. There was nothing else in oh, there. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't. I couldn't fucking believe it. I'm like, who? This is insane. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're. That's a bad situation. No, it's and it, you wonder why people get so fucked up. All it's, malnourished. It's and super shit, common. Yeah. You know, even the even the placing setbacks in the politics. So like, I have this. I'm different, you know. So when you say like, how did I face these things, like. I mean, I thri- uncontrollable. I thrive in adversity. I thrive in 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 situations where I'm the underdog. I thrive in being knocked down. Like I've learned from a very early age to I use Thrive Market. In, in, in nice commercial. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. 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 I wanted to add that in. <laughs> I I really really um, embrace those situations in my life. So you know. Not it's not for everybody. Not everybody likes to be in that position. Don't like to be the underdog. Don't like to be like tell me that I got sixth place because somebody else looked better or this or that. Like cool, that's only going to fuel my training for the next three months for the next show. Like tell me I'm still not good enough. Tell me that stuff. That only fires a guy like me up. That doesn't that doesn't deter me from continuing to press press through. And I, you got to kind of have that mental space in a competitive, subjective sport like bodybuilding because oh i think i feel like you would just get so frustrated otherwise and be like fuck it because you can't control that yeah part. a lot of do yeah. yeah and then they turn it then they turn into victim people where they just point the fingers at oh it's so bullshit it's politics fuck this it's like well yeah it is but here's the way i looked at it like that motivated this is the way it motivated me was i'm gonna come and i'm gonna be so fucking badass 
that the crowd is going to make a noise because they didn't place me. And it got to that point <laughs> where they would move me and they would move me out and the crowd would be like, you'd hear the rumble. Right. Like, because it was so obvious that I was fucking that far ahead of the people that were standing to my right and my left. So that's how, if you, if you allow their, if you allow room you know, like it's close, like you're going to lose. Like the guy who's got a friend of a friend is going to win. The guy who's a little bit better looking than you is going to win. The guy with 40,000 followers is going to win if you allow it to. If you allow a half a percent of body fat or one muscle on your body kind of close, then you're going to turn it into this bullshit game. But if you come in with the attitude like, I'm going to smash my competition, like I will be the most symmetrical, diced person that gets up on stage. Like, And I, there was lots of room for me to be better. Like I was a terrible poser. If I actually cared about the sport and actually put some energy into posing, I think I would have I would have dominated even faster too. I just yeah. didn't put the energy. Well, when you that. pose for me and Justin, we appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you keep it up. Next question is from Adventure Link. I have been adding priming to my workouts and have noticed a significant improvement. Playing golf today, I noticed I was stiff in certain areas. Would you suggest priming before playing? If so, what type of exercises would you suggest? Oh. oh, interesting. You got to do priming before any physical activity yeah. is going to give you a tremendous it's, substantial it, benefit. Where are, you at, where are you at with this, Justin? Uh, I, I've been working on this very thing as far as like golf specifically too. So it's Yeah, like, I knew that. I didn't know how how far are we from letting it go or where are we at with it? So I have um, basically all the content is there now. I just need to shoot video if we're going to do that or just like uh, come up with the imagery. Yeah, yeah. So it's so literally we're, we're sitting on like a lot of this this question uh, specifically as far as like the, the types of movements you're trying to um, prime ahead of time towards. And so, you know, if you can think of it uh, – Obviously, like rotational elements in there are going to be something that, you know, you want to you want to like prime and get the, the central nervous system to respond to. But even more so, it's it's a lot of, you know, the hip hinging. It's it's a lot of like anti rotation. So it's being able to uh, create intrinsically this this force production, but do it under control. And so um, there's a lot of like very specific types of exercises in there to help to sort of place your body in the right position to really squeeze mm -hmm. and, 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 and communicate that to your, to your body, uh, to then be able to respond appropriately. And, 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 and really like mobility is, is it's creating this type of a stretch, but it's creating strength in that stretch. Well, you know, you said something about anti-rotation. I think this is an important uh, thing to know. Like when you're, when you're generating force in a particular direction, Let's say you're throwing a baseball or you're throwing a punch. Let's say you're throwing a punch and you're a boxer. Many times, what's limiting your power, besides technique, obviously technique plays the biggest role. So let's forget that for a second, right? Let's just pretend, because technique you get better at just through practice. That's obvious. So let's, let's take that out for a second. Mm -hmm. The thing that is preventing you from generating more power isn't your inability to generate power. It's your ability to control that power. Yeah. So in other words, if I'm throwing a punch as hard as I possibly can, it's not the muscles that throw the punch that limit me, the fact that they're not strong enough to throw it faster. It's the muscles that prevent my humerus from flying off my body or twisting and tearing mm -hmm. You know that is preventing me from throwing a harder or punch. Or get, getting your whole body rotating in that direction. Right, Well, that, but, and that's yeah. a technique thing also, but you're right. And so my point with this is your limiting factors isn't your inability to generate that force. It's your ability to control that force or at least feel safe in that force because what your central nervous system does without you realizing – is your CNS will limit your force, speed, and power in within a parameter of what it considers to be safe, mm -hmm. okay? So for the average person, they've done tests on this, the average person can generate something like 60 to 75% of their actual force. Their body will limit them within that range because anything out of that, their body senses may be dangerous and may cause them to hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, high-level athletes or, or like Olympic lifters, for example. Olympic lifters are the best, in my opinion, at exemplifying this. Olympic lifters could probably generate up to 95% of what they can actually generate max because not only have they taught their body that it's safe to do so, but they've also trained in a way to where it is safe uh, to do so. Um, and, and by the way, this is why you know, you go to lift something and you see what your max is and then, you know, you're in an emergency situation. Maybe there's a weight pinned on a loved one and all of a sudden you find the strength to lift something that you couldn't normally do. It's not because you all of a sudden grew new muscle. It's because your body understood that this is life or death. We can hurt ourselves. We don't give a shit. 
rather than going 70%, let's pump it up to 90% and you're able to generate the strength. So my point with this is, you know, a very primitive way to prime golf, a very primitive basic way to prime golf is to swing, right? You're just swinging the club and practicing. That's like the the super most basic way to prime. A, a much more effective and advanced way to prime is to prime the muscles and activate the muscles that slow down mm -hmm. your swing and give you stability and control so that when you get up there, you can maximize your technique and your power. This is true for any sport. Mm -hmm. That way your, your body feels safe going as hard as you possibly can. This is probably why when you do something, you're, you're, if, when you try exerting yourself- It allows yourself, for accuracy too. Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, so that, and that's the thing about, it's complex when, when you talk about sports because you need to be able to generate you know a lot of force like on command and then you need to be able to rely on your body to go through the mechanics almost like automatically. So it's not something that you have to think about or squeeze and connect to. So you have to have this loose ability to be able to trust in the skill that you've you've acquired to mm -hmm. then drive you. But then, like you said, control that momentum and, and harness it back in so you, you're balanced and you're under that control. So... Um, you know, all that considered, those are like, those are three different sort of components to, you know, bring into the golf. This game. is where I also like using like uh, band distractions, right? Like mm -hmm. a, band, oh, perfect. a band distraction at like your end range of motion, right? So part of like with sports too is like the control from, from one direction to the other. Right, that's where a lot of like form is lost. That's where a lot of power is lost. Is like when you're going from the backswing, when you're pulling back, and then you're going back the other direction. It's that split second when you're pulling the back the change of direction. The change of direction mm -hmm. where there's a little bit of play, and if you don't have good control in that that exact position right there, it's because it's their end range of motion. Right. 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 So going to your end range of motion of a, of any sport. So we're talking about golf. So end range of motion on, on the swing, creating some sort of a band distraction in that area kind of forces you to get connected neurologically in that area and create tension there. So you could do that. You can also add a prop, uh, you know, with like I, I show in, in the, example like using a stick and, and creating and driving that force like in that back part of the swing but also consider that your knees are internally rotating so that's something that a lot of people don't concentrate on communicating to their body like specifically they just sort of shift their hips but we also need to understand how to kind of you know like add a little more tension and muscular control uh, in that direction. And so that's something I, I, I highly suggest you prime ahead of time. So that way your body's responding with that shift of force from left to right. And then, you know, transference. Now this, we, and this was a problem that we tried to tackle with, uh, with maps prime. What made it so difficult to write was the following, the way you prime your individual body can be different than the way someone else primes their individual body right. for the same exact physical endeavor. So if Justin and I are golfers and we go out and we want to prime our bodies for golf, Justin and I may have completely different sure. priming protocols. Be a different hitch in my swing somewhere. There, there's yeah, there's you know different you know muscle imbalances, different recruitment patterns, mm -hmm. and so this was why it was so hard to write prime because we're like, how are we going to write a prime? Like, what are we going to do? Either the options were this: mm -hmm. we either write how to prime every exercise in a very general way, like this is how you prime a squat, this is how you prime. But then we would sit there and debate, and we're like, yeah, but yeah, what if somebody has this? What if somebody has no, that? You're like, so right because I can't even put somebody in a proper swing if they can't get enough retraction out of their shoulder and depression. They don't even know how to get their body to respond properly with exactly. that. Exactly. So, and, and then, of course, especially if you're a yeah. beginner. Or even hip hinge and, and then if you're a beginner and you go play and you go swing the, the club and you don't prime properly, you're going to learn how to hit best with bad <laughs> recruitment patterns. Yeah. And now you've limited, severely limited how good you could possibly get, you know, later on down the line. Right. So you see people with like excessive back arches trying to create yeah. this weird swing. And it's just like they don't even know. They don't even have like their they don't have any activity in their TVA and they don't know how to like connect to that and really mm -hmm. brace their, their spine uh, through this complex movement. So it's like you said, it's, it, I would suggest nailing prime specifically oh, just, yeah. just our wall test, our uh, windmill, test. windmill test, you know, our squat test. Just that's a great place to start. If, if oh, you, if you nailed those, I guarantee your swing will be fucking stellar. Dude, it'll be excellent. If you, aren't we flying Brandon out here? Yes. So when's, when's he Brand, fly out? Brandon PFS. Yeah. If you guys check him out, he's brilliant. And they have a golf PFS too, awesome. which is very specifically golf uh, uh, information as far as to how to, you know, add mobility and add like, uh, you know, like lots of skill, like golf related skill mm -hmm. and strengthen that skill. 
Yeah, so it, I mean, I guess the short answer is priming will benefit any physical endeavor. Anything you do physical where you want to perform, if you prime your body properly, you're going to perform better faster. And so what I mean by that is many times what people will say is, it takes me like 15 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour to really start to get into my groove. Well, how would you like to get into that groove f- right away? Like right first first set or first time you swing, you're like, Psh, you feel it because you've primed your body properly. Because yeah, you're connected. Because you're absolutely connected. And so, you know, if you don't have MAPS Prime, I highly suggest enrolling in it, take the compass test and then figure out how to prime your individual body. And then that'll give you a great priming session and for golf. look out for further content. Exactly. Uh, check this out. We have a bunch of free guides available. There's like 12 of them, you know, how to train your chest, how to train your calves, how to get a flat stomach or flat tummy, uh, you know, how to do hit training properly. All these guides are free. All you got to do is go to mindpumpfree.com and get one or get all. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.